Welcome to the third episode of the Research Liaison Team Open Knowledge Podcast. My name is Holly Limbert and I'm the Repository and Open Access Librarian at the University of Derby. I'm based in the library and I manage the university's research repository, Eudora, and provide advice and guidance on the open research landscape with a particular focus on open access. The release of this podcast is in celebration of Open Access Week and I will be joined by some expert guest speakers to discuss their roles and passions equity and open knowledge, and the future of scholarly communications. This episode will focus on open access funder mandates. I'm pleased to welcome Julie Baldwin, who is a research librarian at the University of Nottingham, and in her current role, she primarily supports researchers in their open access publishing endeavours, but has a strong interest in championing innovation and advocacy, and is also interested heavily in copyright. Julie has published an article examining the early stages of the UK Scholarly Communications Licence Initiative. The UK Scholarly Communication Licence, attempting to cut through the Gordian knot of the complexities of funder mandates, publisher embargoes, and research caution in achieving open access, co-authored with Professor Stephen Pinfield at the University of Sheffield. Welcome Julie, and thank you for joining me today. To begin, could you please tell us a little about yourself, your background, and your professional interests? Uh, yeah, I'm Julie Baldwin. I'm a research librarian um, with the University of Nottingham Library's research support team. Uh, so we um, support our researchers at the university um, with kind of advice and guidance and support around kind of scholarly communications and publishing. Um, I do a lot of work around supporting researchers on open access and helping them navigate various funder policies and their obligations. Um, I also do some work around research data management um, and also uh, uh, copyright uh, and I'm also interested in um, other forms of kind of widening open access, so like open access monographs things. Um, so yeah, I'm relatively new to my professional career. Um, I've uh, working at Nottingham, I worked uh, in customer services roles um, for about five years. Then qualified with my uh, MA in librarianship in 2017. Then spent the last four years um, working at Nottingham in Open Access. So uh, it's really all I've known, uh, Open Access and, and, and libraries. So um, yeah, very happy today. Thank you. And obviously open access and kind of the scholarly comms landscape is kind of ever evolving, ever shifting, um, oh. probably probably more than ever at the minute. Um, and one of the interesting things that you mentioned there was kind of, you know, the funder policies. And I suppose what we're seeing now is more or less an alignment between some of the large external funding organisations and their open access policies. So. I'm thinking about you know uh, UK research and innovation, Coalition S, Welcome Trust, etc. Why do you think this is? Um, do you think this will extend also to the next uh, policy for REST, the next open access policy for REST? I think we're kind of moving now into a new stage of open access, um, and I kind of start out kind of with open access in around the 2000s. Um, that was kind of a, a, an opportunity for one of the internet and quite a grassroots type movement. Um, so kind of important scholarly uh, movement, but it didn't really kind of reach critical mass until we've, we've had um, the policies that we've kind of still got or have just recently had um, in place in the UK. So, you know, the Wealth and Trust Policy, UK Research Council, then the REF, um, so obviously all of these are starting to make um, the open access movement kind of gain speed and have you know more weight and bigger impact. But it did mean with the funders coming on board that then there was a very fine balance between the different people um, involved in these policies. So you've got the funder, you've got the institution, the publisher, and, and the researcher. Um, and so it, it's caused some issues and it's caused some kind of ingrained issues um, from the policies that were in place, um, which there was a, a large kind of reliance 
on hybrid open access, um, which you know kind of has become quite an unsustainable model for open access. Yeah. Um, a lot of funders kind of piling all the money uh, into publishers' pockets um, via this model, um, and that, again, that's kind of that balance. The publishers seem to kind of be um, tipping, it's tipping in the weight of the publishers. That balance. Um, they were able to quickly kind of manoeuvre their own publishing models to suit this new funding stream from um, funders. And, and, you know, there's also this issue around um, copyright um, with researchers wanting to publish basically where they want, which is fair enough. Um, but with these funder mandates, obviously, an effort that they have to kind of um, with, but at the same time, the funders don't want to be super prescriptive, so then you've got things like embargoes coming into play where publishers are asking um, researchers to embargo their work, which to a point um, complied with uh, funder mandates and to a point allowed researchers to publish where they want um, because researchers up to now are still signing over their copyright yeah. to publishers um, and again that's kind of an ingrained issue um, which kind of comes all, all comes back to what they see as impact um, and that kind of kudos that they would get from publishing yeah. in various uh, in various venues um, so they've given their copy, copyright freely away to these journals because in return, they will get the kudos of publishing with that particular journal. Um, so again, it basically becomes a big knot. It's a big knot of um, ingrained practices, which basically haven't amounted to immediate open access. And right. I think we're now at a stage where the funders have got to a point where they they realise that these policies aren't fit for purpose anymore. Um, or, or haven't been fit for purpose, and, and and it's not achieving really what they want. want. The cult has happened. I don't think you could deny that. I think now it's more or less accepted that open access. The thing it's something that people should be doing, um, but the mechanisms that have been in place um, for the, certainly the last couple of years don't really seem that sustainable. Um, and of course, there was a point when different funders were saying different things. You have F who wanted green open access, you had UTRI or, or the research councils who wanted gold open access. So again it, it's been very complicated it's been a very complicated landscape. So I think there's kind of two reasons basically all of that I'm kind of summing up the two reasons why I think um, we're now seeing this kind of alignment. Um, one is the the funders wanting to achieve immediate open access um, and now maybe at a stage where they feel like that, that cultural shift has happened enough to move the conversation on and that kind of wanting the policies to be aligned with each other so like you said there, there is there is more or less an alignment between what UKRI wants, what Coalition S want, what Work and Trust want yeah. Um, yeah so I think I think those really are the, the kind of main reasons why I think this is happening. Um, you know, it did kind of converge with the, with the Plan S um, movement, which was, what, 2018 now, yeah. I think? Yeah. Um, so I think they've now got that kind of overarching set of principles, that manifesto that people are now using in their own local OA policies with the most recent being the UKRI policy. Um, the REF aspect is interesting. I think it's 100% going to be impacting a lot more researchers. So that will definitely be something that I think there's are going to and, and Research England are going to bear in mind. I mean, the UKRI, I think 
UKRI are putting in more or less double the amount of funding to fund their new policy. So, right. and that's just the UKRI funded authors. Yeah. So, if, if you know, if that was to extend to everyone who's covered by REF as well, you know, yeah. that's talking a lot more money or 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 some other element of, you know, also if they were trying to go down um, more focusing on the green route, that's a lot more effort and pressure that they've got to work with with um, publishers. So I think I think this UKRI policy is probably the direction of travel, but I don't, I just, I can't see it personally being practical for them to have the exact same policy as, as the UK RI. Yeah. Policy. I think in the policy it would say that if you are compliant with the UK RI policy, you will also be compliant with the REF policy. It does. You're right. It does. But, but, I, but that's not the other way around, is no. it? So I think, I think, yeah, I think it's kind of a flavour of the intention of what they want from REF. I don't. I don't personally see it being something that will be convinced there'll be a lot of forceful um, kind of lobbying and, and people wanting to kind of, you know, put in their own viewpoints on this. I think there's going to be quite a a robust consultation yeah I, I think you're right i think yeah if you think about kind of the way that ukri and plan s etc have gone in terms of green and zero embargo etc i always think or it makes me wonder about the stuff that people have already published that they want to submit for the next ref um yeah you know what's going to happen with that in terms of kind of compliance which is a bit of a worry um, but yeah, I mean, and you've already touched on this quite a lot in your in your previous um, response. But so it's one of the biggest challenges for researchers when ensuring compliance with these open access policies, particularly with the Plan S, you know, and UKRI and Welcome, is rights retention, um, you know, and zero embargo requirements. I suppose one of the uh, and one of the things I'm most interested in is. What's the greatest challenge you think for researchers relating to these requirements in particular? How do you think the research, like researchers, how, what do you think their kind of response is? I mean, you've probably had many responses to this already in, in your day to day work, but just interested to know yeah. what the greatest challenges are that you think. It's a, it's a difficult area to speak about because it's so, um, it's such new territory. It's such, a, and it, it's quite a. I think. I think ultimately the biggest challenge at the moment is that it's a completely unproven area. Yeah. Um, it's not. It's retaining isn't a practice that goes on um, currently at a one scale. You know, as I've mentioned, most or a lot of academics in order to publish with the publishers they want to. And I think even though um, there are a lot of reasons to retain rights, up until now, and there hasn't really been the kind of, it's not as important to researchers, I don't think it hasn't been. I, I think they are very happy that they can publish in the venues that they want to. That is the price they're willing to pay for for it. Um, but of course, we know and funders know that this then puts everyone in a bit of a pickle in terms of complying with these mandates. Um, I think one of the issues we are going to see now, they can say exactly how people can use the work um, and they're getting the economic benefits from it. Um, but we're now starting to see some publishers kind of outrightly saying, you know, we don't agree with rights retention, um, where these policies are starting to 
uh, um, kind of introduce these mechanisms for retaining rights under copyright law. So um, I think both the UK RIs and the Wellcome Trust certainly have um, kind of a rights retention mechanism within their policies, which mostly um, relies on research, including like a little bit of text in their policy, yeah. in their um, submission for publication, where they kind of say that they will retain copyright in the author's accepted manuscript that is created um, upon acceptance into that journal and will be licensed under a Creative Commons license or CC BY license. Yeah. Um, so this kind of prior notification that funders are asking researchers to put into their, to their work. Um, the issue being that this seems, as far as we can tell, this seems to be something which um, is relatively legally sound in terms of copyright mm -hmm. law. Um, yeah. because as first owner of copyright are allowed to do this and they are giving this prior notification to the publisher to say this is what they intend to do. The issue is that publishers are going to be coming back at them under contract law. Mm. So, uh, you know, if they then stick a, a, a contract, a publishing contract under a researcher's nose that does say, you know, I will abide by these embargo lengths and this type of thing. Um, and the researcher signs it, then, and then puts in something into a repository of zero embargo, publishers could then argue that they've broken their contract. Yeah. And, you know, and it goes back to this kind of contract law versus copyright law type of thing. Um, and basically it's unproven. No one really wants to take that first step of being the institution that goes against this, uh, against the publisher. So until that happens, we don't know, we don't really know who's in the right um, mm. in the UK law. It's not based on, you know, case law. So we need that kind of first precedent to yeah. suggest, um, um, to just suggest what, you know, what, which, which of these is going to be the one that comes out on top. So I think for libraries, universities, and I mean, at the end, ultimately, funders and half publishers are putting researchers in the middle, and it's, you know, they're between a bit of a rock and a hard place. Um, we're also in that same place yeah. as we're trying to advise on this. I think it's very hard for anyone to kind of, as a librarian in any institution, to kind of say exactly uh, this is definitely the case because we just don't know. So it's a mm. case of trying to highlight to researchers what the situation is, I guess. Um, but it's hard enough for, I mean, I'm someone who knows. I would like, I'd like to think of myself as someone well versed in copyright, as someone, as a researcher, you know, who's, this is such a fringe thing of what they're doing every day. It's such, it's such a hard thing to get your head around. Um, and it's so complicated. But I, I think the biggest, the, one of the biggest challenges is really, how can researchers be able to make informed decisions on this? Yeah. Because the only person who can really make that decision, whether they want to be potentially in breach of their contract or do they want to be in breach of their funder, uh, funder, um, their funder uh, agreements, you know, we can't make that decision for them. Um, we don't want to, most librarians aren't in a situation where they're able to advise on this. Um, with great expertise and you know even at the end of the day expertise isn't the same as being a qualified lawyer absolutely um so we're in a difficult position the researcher is in a difficult position and the funders and the publishers are just both going to be relying on their interpretation of the law 
yeah, until something kind of gives, I'm not sure how this is going to be resolved. But having said all of that, <laughs> if that could, if we can get authors retaining rights, that is going to be a really amazing thing. And it, if if there can be a way forward through through this authors will have so much more control over their own work um, and I think we are, especially as all these policies are becoming more and more um, geared towards immediate open access, Yeah. authors having the control over their own work it can only help this because they can then comply with these policies and obviously the whole reason that we're all doing this is because we all believe open access is a good thing. Yeah. You know, I suppose sometimes I think of it like, you know, with rights retention, like the concept of open access, you know, way back. Um, oh. It's kind of like the rights retention strategy or just rights retention in general. And it's like, what will it be in like, you know, I don't know, 10 years time, maybe will be a similar kind of movement with what open access was 20 years ago. Um, I think I think we've got quite a long way to go before it becomes kind of like general practice. And like you say, we need to see, we need that first example, don't we, of where, you know, someone's yeah. challenged a publisher or, um, but I think that's really interesting what you were saying about, um, you know, librarians and information professionals kind of being the middleman between <laughs> the funder mandates and the researchers and kind of trying to communicate these really complex policies. Um, and this has kind of come up quite a few times in different conversations that I've had with people, but do you think that funders should do more to support this kind of, you know, to support librarians and information professionals and the communication to research communities? Do you think they could do more? To, to help library and informational professionals? Yeah, and to help kind of like get the message out there more, because I feel like we kind of just get landed with these policies. Um, and then that's it's kind of like right well there's the policy now communicate it yeah i think i think that's exactly right i think there's often a bit of a mismatch between well i think there's a mismatch between three people involved i think the people who write the policies are I'm presuming very unlikely to be the people implementing the policies. Right. And the people implementing the policies, i.e., library librarians and, and information professionals, are trying to convey these messages to researchers on the ground who have to abide by them, but who again aren't versed in them in the way that we are either. So there's kind of a, a complete mismatch between all three and I think I guess the, so it kind of flows down from the top from the funders through us to the to the um, researchers so I think again kind of being in that middle position the thing we really need is clear consistent messaging the funders saying one thing we interpret it in a specific way and then the researchers have to interpret or we say in a specific way yeah um, so I think Clarity and consistency is really important, and I think that's been really again talking about earlier about different policies sometimes saying different things. Yeah, it's so easy to get confused, and it's so easy to have one thing saying one thing and one thing saying another. And again, it's that it's that weighing up of oh, what do I do? You know, do I do I be compliant with REF or do mm. I be compliant with my funder? Is there going to be a difference? If I publish in this publication, will it be okay for one thing but not not for another funder? So it's that kind of hopefully the movement towards aligning policy should kind of help from that point of view. But I think I think maybe they've already started that step to help in that way. I think the alignment of policies is yeah. one way of getting kind of good, clear and consistent messaging. Yeah. The other thing is if you ever in a room or, or or on a Zoom call 
or something with a bunch of librarians <laughs> looking at a policy, I'm sure, you know, the issue, there's going to be an issue of kind of coverage, yeah. you know, because a funder will probably think, work on a policy for ages and ages, and they think, oh, we've covered every single thing. You know, this yeah. really covers all the bases, and then you get in a room, or, you know, you pour over it with a couple of librarians, and then, you know, two minutes later, they've got 101 new questions or new scenarios that haven't been thought of in the in the guidance and the policy. Um, so something I'm aware of in the new UKRI policy is there's no mention of the journal checker tool, mm. the, the tool that the yeah. trust have kind of um, championed. And then it's a case of, well, what does that mean? You know, yeah. is that it's that interpretation again. Does that mean that they aren't saying that it's something that we should be using? Are they saying um, is it just something they haven't thought of? You know, it's that, it's kind of double. It's that kind of double guessing or second guessing yeah. what what funders are thinking. The main issue, especially cut with the current policies, is coming in a bit of some like drips and drab. Mm, so yeah. we've got the main policy and we have the guidance. But there's lots of different pieces of guidance around and funding and all I think that we don't, don't have yet. So um, trying to plan for communication stuff when you've got big gaps in knowledge is quite hard. Um, yeah. So kind of a clear roadmap but also a quick one because I think there's some guidance we're still not going to be getting until like December, yeah. which, you know, given the policy starts in April, if there's some part of it that you either need to get out to your entire research community or it needs to go through some sort of university committee to be able to put in the mechanism for the policy, I think, yeah, so I think clear, consistent messaging from funders, also a clear contact point. Um, for when we do come up with these extra scenarios that haven't been thought up, um, someone that you can go to and actually get a good response from. Um, and then if things can't all be launched at once, having kind of a really clear guidance of exactly when the next piece of guidance is coming out. Um, yeah. So it could be said that um, the funder mandate has been designed to positively disrupt the academic publishing industry. However, it's no secret that this has remained remarkably resilient. Do you think that the funders are doing enough to put pressure on an industry that is still very much dominated by the big publishers and big players like Elsevier, Taylor and Francis, etc.? And I suppose one which one way in which they're doing this is via the introduction of these read and publish agreements or the transitional agreements. Um, so yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think they are doing enough? So most of these policies are now not supporting the hybrid open access model, or rather, I suppose when I say support, I mean funding. So technically you can still comply by publishing in a, in a hybrid model journal, but UKRI or World Control wouldn't fund it. What they are willing to fund are, like you said, these transformative agreements. So yeah, I guess that is the funders kind of putting their money where their mouth is in terms of they are willing to support this type of model. Um, and that in itself is putting the pressure on the publishers to come up with these models and yeah. to come up with financially sustainable uh, transformative agreements. Um, we know with, like I said, with some of the bigger players, the negotiations for these types of agreements can go on for a very long time and, you know, very um, tactical and, yeah. and we're trying to get the most value for money that we can. Um, publishers are also similarly trying to get um, the most money out of us that they can. So, yeah, the fund is um, supporting transformative agreement is um, it is a useful way of, again, I guess it's the whole point, it's transformative, it's transitional, yeah. um, it's, it's trying to move away from one model and trying to act 
effectively yeah, disrupt the publishing models that we have now and moving it to, I mean, ultimately, I guess, a pay to publish model as the way that as the way that people access content. Um, yeah. You've got to hope that these transitional agreements aren't going to become just the new big deal, right. you know, it's not a case of just packaging up, read and publish together forevermore. Um, these are supposed to be transitional, they're supposed to be moving towards media open access for everything. If everything's immediately open access, why would you have a subscription cost? You wouldn't. No. So, um, I think, and I think it's interesting to see um, that there's a time limit that the, will, the funders are willing to fund these types of models. I think it's I think it's 2024, end of 2024. Yeah. That, to me, signals that, again, they're seeing it as a um, kind of a, a stepping stone to something else towards full open access for all journal content, which seems kind of ambitious when you say it like that. Um, but the University of California, I think I'm right in saying the University of California um, negotiations, which is obviously a very high profile LGBT yeah. negotiations, which took years and years and years. Um, I'm pretty sure that the deal they eventually struck, the detail of the deal was that all of the, all of, it was 100% published cost, 0% read cost. Yeah. So I think they were already kind of switching to a, um, what they wanted to see the kind of long term yeah. plan to be. So but again it's it's gonna come down to these publishers are able to maneuver much quicker than we are, much quicker than funders are. They have probably people on this type of thing as their entire job, you know. How yeah. can we react to this? How can we get ahead of these policies? Um, what kind of things can we do for ourselves in the best um, a position which we as librarians and institutions do not have. No. Um, so I think we're always going to be slightly on the back foot in that sense, but it is a, it is a positive step that funders are putting their foot down around um, hybrid open access. They're the ones who, are, who have been funding this model for such a long time. Um, so they've recognised that this isn't sustainable um, is a good thing. I think the other kind of element to these funder mandates is sanctions. Yeah. I think, you know, mm. most policies there's an element of carrot and stick. And I think in years gone by, We've been missing a bit of that stick. Um, I think for some, I was talking to someone once, they said, you know, um, a policy without sanctions, basically a policy with no teeth. Mm -hmm. But we know with things like the REF, the financial incentive yeah. to, um, to comply with the various policies of the REF has meant such a much wider institutional focus on so, I think if there's not something like that, which is likely to be, because obviously the rest um, portion of that QR funding, which isn't really something that's translatable to kind of these, you know, individual grant funding yeah. type projects, but sanctions at some level either to the institutional, the fund, or to the individual. Um, would would be one way to put more pressure on everyone. And I'm not saying that that's what I agree with, I'm just saying that's <laughs> one way of doing it. Um, but it is going to be putting everyone in a... It, it, it again, goes back to that kind of being in between a rock and a hard yeah. place. Um, but the leverage that a, fun, a funder has is that they can sanction. Um, so they're the ones with the money, and they're the ones that can decide who gets it, who doesn't get it. We just go back.
back to this, what we were talking about, just about transformative agreements and things. Um, and obviously, you know, the funders are trying to transition to 100% open access, but then potentially this could mean instead of paying for, you know, subscription access, it's all paying for publishing, which kind of just takes knowledge commodification from one area to another, really. Um, what are your thoughts on Diamond Open Access being a viable option for authors to ensure compliance with funder mandates? And just in general, really, I think, you know, Diamond, Diamond potentially has um, a sustainable future over kind of gold. Um, so maybe that could be a way for authors to ensure compliance whilst, you know, not having to pay a fee. more sustainable than gold I don't know but uh, so with Diamond Open Access being kind of free to read and free to publish it is a really interesting model um, I think my understanding is most of the funding you know the kind of funding model for this whilst it varies is usually kind of either it gets subsidized by other journals in a kind of a portfolio of journals, some which would charge, or they're run by learned societies or institutions who kind of, they're the ones who kind of take on the cost. So, I mean, my experience is, and kind of my understanding is they might not always be the biggest publishers, mm. and they might not have access to the best systems or software or technical infrastructure, they might be run by volunteers, they might be yeah. small journals. So I think I think for this reason there is need for support for them to kind of have a diverse uh, a diverse of options, you know, for for people to publishing. And I think none of these things I've just mentioned makes them any less respectable or reputable. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. By by them being free to publish in and likely to be offering a compliant option, there are certainly one way that uh, that researchers can publish whilst being compliant with funder. Um, and it kind of like it kind of takes out a possible element, a possible barrier to it, it by not having to pay and to publish with them. Um, I guess. Again, on the basis that some of them might be smaller kind of publishing outfits, you always need to make sure that they're complying with all the various elements of these policies, right. you know, because there's now kind of technical, you know, requirements for journals to have and be listed in the Directory of Open Access Journals and that type of thing. So, um, again, it's one it's weighing up. Um, all the different options. Coalition S, I think, have done a report on diamond access, so it's interesting to kind of bring this up. Um, I think they are trying to do more work on this publishing model um, and kind of strengthen it as an as an option um, to publish it. I think uh, they have. They have. You're right. Report. You're right. <laughs> um, they, I think it was something like the Diamond Way Journals report. Yeah. Or something. There's definitely the option then for it to be something to consider for authors. Um, and also, if you're thinking about potentially, I always think about, you know, some of these funder mandates might be said to favour some of the more research intensive institutions where there may be more money to support, you know, the gold route to open access. But for those institutions that are post 92 or you know less research intensive potentially diamond could be a different option um yeah yeah again it's it's um it's widening out the publishing options for people like say in different situations a different space of their career at different institutions right it, it, it kind of goes it's a lot of what gets talked about in the kind of open monograph set, uh, kind of you know, spiel is that what we need is a diverse publishing landscape. Absolutely. It's not you either publish in Elsevier or 
or you don't publish at all. Mm. You know, there needs to be lots of different options. Um, and yeah, Diamond is definitely an option that, like you say, is something that can be available to everyone and might be more helpful for um, some people in, in certain situations, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for listening to this third episode of the Open Knowledge Podcast. And special thanks to Julie for such an insightful discussion around some of the complexities that we're seeing with funder mandates. We'll be back soon with more episodes.